Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Munzer. I'm the VP of Innovation and Development for Hasselmeyer. So uh, I want to talk to you today about um, some work we do in Hasselmeyer on uh, simulation and modeling and just give you some basics about the importance of, of that type of work and the relevance to both device development and, and combination product development. You know, the goal today is really to do a very basic introduction, so we're not going to get technical or anything, but just to give you some kind of common background. Uh, just as a way of introduction, for those of you who don't know Hasselmeyer, so we're the global uh, drug delivery brand of MedMix. Uh, historically, we've been an independent family-owned company, actually for over 100 years, but then recently we were uh, acquired as part of the MedMix business. So within... Uh, Hasselmeyer itself, we've got about uh, 240 employees. We have manufacturing both in Europe and in India, and are very excited that we're going to also be manufacturing uh, in the U.S. in a couple of years. So but, you know, we're a 1345 uh, registered company. We do both platform drug delivery devices, but we also do a lot of work on custom devices. So really, if you have a, an injection need, you can come to Hasselmeyer, and we can help you out. We're, oh, there we go, okay. So again, what I want to talk to is sort of the, you know, using our auto injector as a case study, sort of the benefits of why we invest in things like simulation modeling, give you some basics of the type of models and some example applications, and then finally talk about where we see things going. And uh, you may have even heard there's lots of buzz in the industry around digital twins and things like that. And so kind of give you a bit of perspective of how that relates to drug delivery. You know, so this is a typical auto-injector. To the patient, we really want to make this to be a very simple device. It's small, compact, doesn't have a lot of kind of touch points. The user just takes the cap off and they inject it. So really, you know, again, want to be as unassuming and as simple as possible. But when, when an engineer looks at this, you see it's a really complex physics problem. We've got stored energy in a spring. We've got a drug going through a needle, and usually the viscosity changes as the force in there, making it non-Newtonian. We've got, we've got rubber materials that interact. There's impact energy. And so as a physics problem, and that's what we really care about as engineers, it's a complex system. And for us to be successful as a combination product, we've got to be able to put all that together in a way that makes sense, and we can control it and make sure it delivers to our patients every time. So, when we talk then about tackling this complex problem, one of the big tools we can use is simulation and modeling. And so this is a way to take complex systems and simplify them to a level where we can quantify and control the results. And this gives us a benefit in multiple ways. By modeling things on a computer, we can understand trade-offs in a system before we go build physical components. And that helps us really get feedback in our design if we you know, simulate on the computer, we can make a change, we can see how that affects, and we can do that quickly, where if we need to go into physical components, that can take, you know, months, maybe weeks if we kind of 3D print things, but it doesn't give us that kind of feedback that we need to accelerate developments. And then also, when we do physical testing, you know, we will take a device, you know, if we say do a drop test or we check the dose accuracy or something, we just see that outer result. But with, if you really understand the physics of the device, you can get inside that box, see how the different components interact, see where failures might occur, and understand that full interaction. And then also very important is, you know, we want to make these devices in, you know, millions, tens of millions, even in some cases hundreds of millions of devices a year. And so the variability you see across that manufacturing process you need to understand the impact of that on the performance. And if you only test 60 devices, 100 devices, or maybe even 1,000 devices in a verification program, you're never going to see all of that variability and how it impacts the performance. So now when we talk about simulation, though, you know, it is just a model. And there's a, a, a quote that I really like from a famous British statistician, or at least famous, I guess, as statisticians go for, but he says, all models are approximations, which essentially means that all models are wrong, 
but some of them are useful. And that's what we have to strive for when we do this type of work. We're never gonna make something that 100% represents real life. And that's really the, the art though. We need to know when is it good enough? When can we uh, learn enough from these models that it's useful and we get useful insights out of it? So when trying to lay out this as an introduction, I wanted to try and classify a couple different approaches that we do to modeling. And um, you know, you can, if you go kind of Google this kind of stuff, you can really get quickly bogged down in things like FEA and FEM and CFD, and there's all these very kind of technical uh, jargon around it. And the couple different approaches that we can take to, to simplify the real world, I wanted to try and lay out like this. And, and these were my kind of best attempt to come up with some names, so you probably aren't gonna see these from other vendors or from other things. But we talk about one, if you take the system and you make it down into really discrete pieces, so tiny little bits, um, and that's what we do where, when we do something what's called finite element analysis. So you take this big part and you break it into a thousand or 10,000 little chunks, and now, each of those is one very simple element, and in a computer you can simulate all of those individually, and then when you add it back up into the system, you get the performance of the whole system. The other way you can abstract things is to sort of kind of take a step back out and simplify the elements down into uh, very simple things. This is what we refer to as sort of a parameter model. So instead of a, you know, a plunger rod within an auto injector, it's just a kind of discrete mass. You don't care about the size, you don't care about the shape, it's just got a mass that needs to move. And a, instead of a syringe with a needle, it's just a fluid flow through a pipe and there's maybe some damping in there, but you try and break it down at a high level into simple components that then lets you do simple equations that can describe that system. And then finally, we can also do what we call empirical models. And so this is literally you know, instead of trying to build up a model, if you get physical testing, you can then fit statistical models to that data, which then allow you to make predictions about future performance. And you can see this with simple things like linear regression, but also when people talk about machine learning, all these kind of neural network algorithms, these can be used for those uh, type of approaches as well. So, Here's now some examples of, of these different types of models. So this is a uh, finite element simulation of a uh, needle lockout. So one of the key things in an auto injector is after use, you don't want to be able to override the safety and have a risk of uh, uh, sticking yourself. So this you can see, uh, hopefully it comes across on the, the screens up there you see there's all these little triangles that make up that shape. Each of those is a little element, and so the, the physics on each of those elements is very simple, but as the, you build up this massive calculation, a big matrix, basically, and you can solve that on the computer, it gives you a prediction of the overall system. And with these type of models, we can understand you know, how something will break, how things will deflect under force, how the uh, various loads and conditions will, will impact the strength of the material's uh, ability to withstand it. So these are examples of these discrete models. You can also see things like fluid flow simulations use a similar technique, uh, and you know, other ways where you want to really get that uh, really detailed view of parts of the device. And then a different example, again, this is where we, we talk about these parameter models. You know, for again, for an auto injector, we really care about injection time. And so for injection time, we can take a step back and instead of trying to get into the details, we say, okay, we've got this system of equations, we've got a force balance, we've got some friction, we've maybe got some mass, um, and we can do this uh, calculation. And then again, we said, this is a good example of where we've really looked at the sensitivity. Uh, so you can see this um, uh, distribution here. We can, based on these simple equations, we can model the effect of how does the needle diameter affect injection time? How does the drug concentration, the temperature it's delivered? And these give us these insights we need as designers to know how, how this model performs. And if, you're interested in more on this, this is actually a, a published paper. You can go look it up online, um, and there's a lot more details on how this work was done. So 
colleague Thomas here can also answer questions. He's sitting in the front row who wrote the paper. <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> Um, and then finally, we talk about empirical models. And um, a good example of this is, you know, again, we are trying to replace sort of testing of that, that outer system. Uh, so what we want to do instead is understand the components. And so here, we were really interested in how syringe breakage, especially at the flange, would impact us. And we could have gone and said, OK, let's just build 1,000 auto injectors, and we'll test them and we'll see if any break, and then maybe we're confident. But that really doesn't tell us the details. So instead, you know, we built up a fixture, it let us take syringes, impact them with certain energy levels, and then we could go see when they broke. And then from that, now we can start building a statistical model that says, at this energy, we've got this risk of breaking. And then as the more samples we have, the bigger we can build that confidence. Then we can go into the auto injector and say, OK, we know our energy and our spring is only this level. So now we've got a very high confidence that this flange will not break uh, you know, over millions and millions of devices that we build. So these are some examples of how we can take individual components and then you know, build them you know, looking at different aspects of the device. Uh, where we see this going as an industry is there's this buzzword around a digital twin. And this is the idea that if you can build up models of different aspects, you can eventually kind of create a, a virtual representation of your product that is at the fidelity and the detail. You know, again, it's going to be wrong, but you need to build it up to the level where it's useful. And this is where we're seeing as computers are getting stronger, as sensors are getting better, we've got these better... Uh, machine learning algorithms to integrate all this data. The goal is to have basically, as we develop a physical product, we're developing a digital project at the same time and allowing us to fully understand uh, the performance. And this can help us when we look at combination products. And I think there's two key impacts for pharma for this. Is one, you know, as a pharma company, you are the legal manufacturer of a combination product. Part of that is you need to have a strategy to control the performance of your combination product back through the entire manufacturing system. And so when we really understand our full system, we can go back into the you know, supply chain and say, you know, I have a spring wire, and I've got you know, a test where I know the strength of that wire. It's an incoming control. I do a pull test, it tells me the quality of that wire. I can now follow through the model to say, with all the other inputs I have, that spring will still work and provide me the injection time I need, which the FDA cares about because that's an EPR, an essential performance requirement. But if I don't have this linkage and this understanding of the device, now I'm just building guesses upon guesses of specifications down into the supply chain. And you know, that's just not acceptable today, I think, from a, uh, a quality and control strategy perspective. The regulatory bodies expect us as an industry to be able to control that supply chain. And without having this level of understanding, I think you can't really justify some of the controls, especially as we get further down into the sub-tier and then the sub-tier of those suppliers. Uh, the second thing is we're also seeing now evidence by regulatory bodies accepting computer modeling as uh, evidence of design verification. And so there's a new standard called the ASME uh, VNV40 standard. So this is a um, standard that was developed by ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, but FDA had a heavy involvement in the development of the standard with the idea that you can replace uh, physical testing for device verification with computer simulation. And there's a whole framework, again, this is going back again to that thing of, we know the model's wrong, but it's useful. So there's a risk-based approach, and if you have maybe data, you know, kind of here and here and here, and you know how that performs, when your product ends up in the middle, you can then, instead of having to test that, just rely on the computer simulation and be able to submit that data instead. And I think where we will see this in the future is we can characterize our platform. And if we fully understand how our device works, now you come to us as a pharma company, you've got a syringe, we can characterize at a standalone level the maybe the viscosity, what needle did you select, silicon oil levels. We can now 
predict what the injection time, we can confirm dose accuracy all at a virtual level and not needing to potentially put up thousands of devices in verification. If we fully understand how the stability of the product works, again, it has the potential to minimize a lot of testing and a lot of need that doesn't really add a lot to the value of the product in the long run. And so FDA is supporting this approach, and I think it's upon us to really build up the confidence as an industry uh, to be able to, to use this type of data. And I think that's the, the last point I do want to raise. You know, we, we do see challenges with expanded use of this kind of technology. Uh, you know, where in the, um, you already see like, for example, in the aviation industry, there are components on airplanes that are qualified due to using primarily uh, computer simulation modeling. So this is not something that, you know, risk-sensitive industries are afraid to use. It's just as pharma, I think we've got a bit of barriers. Um, we do have a complex physics in our system, especially when you get into the containers. And so I think, you know, when you really dive into silicon oil layers, drug interactions, how that plays with the moving of the plunger and how it interacts over time, these are tough physics problems. And so, um, we still need some more work to fully understand that to deploy these type of techniques. We also have the challenge that we were very compartmentalized in our knowledge, you know, coming from the device side, we know a lot about the devices, but we've got the syringe suppliers that really understand uh, the, you know, how they're controlling the syringes, sometimes even getting out of them what, how much silicon oil they put in, what's the layer thickness, that information is hard to get. And then the pharma companies, you guys have the information on the rheology, how the viscosity changes, and, and we don't do a great job of sharing that information in a way that uh, allows us to build this understanding. Um, and then finally, I mean, this is, you know, you need to validate this kind of model. This is not something that you just put this out there and all of a sudden you trust it. And so there is a time-consuming amount of work to validate this type of, of modeling. So if we're doing one-off products, the effort probably isn't justified. So instead what we need is, you know, building platforms, having the modeling coming along with those platforms, and having the digital twins there you know, where we can justify the investment. Okay, so in, in summary, you know, I think really want to make the point that, that this kind of work, simulation modeling, is a key enabler for uh, drug device development. And so it's really whether you're talking to us at Hasselmeyer or you're talking to other suppliers, you know, you should be asking for this data. You should be pushing that understanding and making sure, you know, all the levels of the product are understood. Um, so hopefully I was able to understand the different types of models and you've got a little bit of, of that sort of big picture. So if some supplier shows, hey, we did this FEA model of this, you've got at least that, that understanding now of what that is. And then, um, you know, really hope I could provide a bit of a vision of where we can go as an industry and how we can use this type of technology to improve time to market, improve quality, and give better control of the devices for our patients. So that's my overview. Um, thank you again for the time. I'm uh, very happy to take questions. Uh, if you don't get a chance uh, to ask a question today, um, please email me, uh, contact me on LinkedIn. We're still going to be at our booth for a few more hours, so you can stop by there, uh, especially if you're interested in the auto injector as well. We've got samples we can show, um, and uh, we've got some brochures over here as well if anybody's interested. So there's the, the blatant sales pitch part of the presentation, and now I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Yes, there's a question for Chris. Thanks, Chris. Really, really interesting. Thanks for talking about this stuff. Um, I'm interested in um, machine learning mm -hmm. kind of aspect. You mentioned it a couple of times. How do you see it really feeding into this kind of yeah, simulation? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, when you really look at machine learning, you know, at the, oh, lost the mic there a second. You know, so the, at a simplest level, machine learning is, is a statistical technique for fitting data. And I think when the more, sophisticated versions get involved, we need to have the kind of 
high volume of data either, that a Google or an Amazon uh, generates. And so I think until, from a development standpoint, we typically are not going to have that kind of volume of data. So I think um, only, the only kind of machine learning that makes sense, I think, in our cases is maybe very simple, you know, slight step up from linear regression models. You know, we're not going to deploy like neural networks and things like that to, uh, to create these models yet. But I think when you get into manufacturing, now you can generate, you know, millions of data points. You've got real-time sensors and they're you can get into that sort of predictive quality aspect where if the machine sees maybe the parameter on the molding machine deviates, it knows that part is not going to be able to function in the device and we can automatically reject it maybe even if it still was going to meet, say, the, the sort of old school specifications. So. Any other questions? Or like I said, I'm happy to discuss afterwards as well. So hopefully you found that useful. And uh, thanks again for coming.